feminine virtues. We're back in feminine virtues again. I'm going to read you a quote here that I've read you this before. You see if you can tell me the, the origin of it. Maybe you'll understand this quotation here, several of them from one particular individual. Maybe you can understand this a little better with what we said about feminine virtues, how they are so greatly despised by certain segments of people. Christian morality is the most malignant form of all falsehood. What are we studying here in ethics? Morality, Christian morality, is the most malignant, I don't know what this brother's laughing for unless he knows already the source, is the most malignant form of all falsehood. I think someone already said it out there. It is really poisonous, decadent, weakening, it produces nincompoops, not men. It, in other words, it produces women, not men. You know, you've heard the old sayings, Christianity is for young children and old women. It's a religion for young children who need something or someone to fantasize about anyway, and old women who need a male figure to help them through the years of widowhood. And that's what Christianity is all about, according to some thinkers. Well, that may be true, but... Boy, I'd hate to wake up on the other side of the grave and find out it's not true, though. Yeah, yeah, well, what are you going to do about it then? I condemn Christianity and confront it with the most terrible accusation that an accuser has ever had in his mouth. To my mind, it is the greatest of all conceivable corruptions. It converted every value into its opposite. That's about right. <laughs> every truth into a lie, every honest impulse into the ignominy of the soul. You know, like the sexual impulse, let's say that's just an, an honest impulse. The Bible turns it into a sin, he says. <laughs> I call Christianity the one great curse, the one enormous and innermost perversion, the one great instinct of revenge for which no means are too venomous, too underhand, too underground, or too petty. I call it the one immortal blemish on mankind. This Jesus of Nazareth as the personified gospel of love, this Savior bringing blessedness and victory unto the poor and the sick and the sinners, did he not represent seduction in its most, often, in its most awful and irresistible form? Who is that from? Nietzsche. Nietzsche. <laughs> Couldn't be from anyone but our friend we've studied before, Nietzsche. Well, you see, that's what Nietzsche would have to say about mercy. Mercy. Mercy is not something you want to strive for. You know, you've got to. You cannot be kind. You cannot. There are too many downtrodden, undeserving people out there in the world. And if you always get too concerned about them, how can you take care of yourself then? You'd be too busy taking care of all the other people out there. That's not what true life is all about, would be the argument of someone like Nietzsche. Remember, we studied Nietzsche way back in this class. We studied a lot about Nietzsche. He's a blasphemer, all right. Wouldn't you call that a blasphemer? <laughs> Borderline blasphemer. Said Jesus was the most awful seducer in the world, the most horrible deceiver in the world. Well... My, my. I guess I'm glad I'm a woman and not a man then. <laughs> well, a woman compared to him. But, of course, you know, we're turning these things around. And that's what he accused of, turning these virtues around. We'd say that Nietzsche is the woman in the matter. Uh, Christianity is too strong of a force for him to handle. He's too weak. And so the way to get around it is just call it blasphemy. Whenever you, and you're really blaspheming it, but call it blasphemy. That gets the eyes of your critics off of you and onto <coughs> that then. Mercy. We ended by looking at three words. We ended with an adjective in Matthew 5, 7, in Hebrews 2, 17. I didn't turn to the passage in Hebrews 2, 17 because, as sometimes happens with me, I was running out of time. Here's where the adjective Ele emon is found. The E-L-E -E words, the ele, E-L-E -E words, are the mercy words in the New Testament. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful, ele emon, merciful. 
and, and that means full of mercy. This happens to be a contraction of full of mercy, merciful as the adjective, and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Well, that's what he came for, but I don't think Nietzsche's going to benefit from any of that with his blasphemy, though. And Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Blessed are the merciful. That's the word for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Mercy, pity, sympathy, compassion. We're in our third subcategory of the fourth group of virtues. Those are relate specifically to others. Third category is our peaceable manner of life. And the second of these that we'll be looking at will be pity, which was the low word on your chart with our ratings, our soundings from public opinion last time. Mercy was at the top and pity was at the bottom. We've got three words we're going to be dealing with regarding pity, just like with mercy, and they're the oik words, O-I-K-T words. First of all, we have oiktero. 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 It's a verb found twice, both times in Romans 9, 15. Now, the reason I have this already written up here for you is so you can see these words together. Obviously, here's what's common denominator among them, O-I-K-T. And if we had all of our other words up here that we've looked at thus far, our mercy words, we would have this as the common denominator, right? So we're talking about two entirely different groups of words. Why am I saying that? Because of the confusion we're going to find in the NIV and the KJV, as well as confusing these with the sympathy and compassion words. And they all, you can tell, they, they fit in the category by themselves. They're words that are related amongst themselves are related together. They also are related to one another, but notice the spellings are entirely different. Yet they, you can tell these come from the same root. This from one root, the mercy words, the pity words from one root, but yet they're confused. Romans 9.15, this also is a passage where one of the mercy words is found twice. Romans 9.15. The mercy words are okay, But the compassion words don't come from the compassion root, but from the pity terms. Now, there, there definitely is similarities. There definitely are relationships. But again, I'm just going to have to uh, kind of be different and kind of be dogmatic. Uh, it doesn't bother me. I can sit down and read any Bible who wants to confuse all of these terms because... Um, we're not talking about hate versus sympathy or something. We're talking about the words that are related to one another. But yet I have to kind of be narrow in my thoughts because of the fact that these words, these words, these three words, a couple of the sympathy words, a couple of the compassion words, they all are in agreement with themselves. You can see that they came from the same root. And therefore, to give us a, a compassion term where it comes from a spleen term, really, that's where we got our term spleen from the Greek term. For compassion when they come from a different term or different different group of terms he saith to Moses I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have pity on whom I will have pity NIV gives compassion King James gives compassion most of them will give compassion and compassion and pity mean a lot of the same things but they're from different words though so again, we'll just have to kind of be a little narrow and a little different and say it needs to be pity. I will have pity on whom I will have pity. A verb only found twice, and of course it's found twice here in this one verse. I will have pity on whom I will have pity. Then secondly, we have a noun, oiktermos. 
that is found five times. This noun, the second word up here that's found five times. O-I-K-T-I-R-M-O-S. Oitermos. It's rarely ever used in the singular. I think we only have one case of that in the Bible. And few outside of the Bible. It's almost always a plural word. And it is rarely used outside of the Bible. When it is used... It is almost always found in an ecclesiastical setting. In other words, this is just a term that was, that was not used in profane Greek, not used in secular Greek. We're not going to say, of course, that the Christians uh, invent a new word here because it's based on this earlier word, oiktero. But it's a term primarily used in Christian writings. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at the places here. Romans twelve one. Romans twelve one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the pities of God. But that just sounds so funny. But it's not one of the ele, the e l e words for mercy. It's a term for pity. I beseech you, therefore, by God's pity that ye present your bodies the living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Words like this, you just do what, what you want to do. I may sometimes read it mercy, but I'll probably have a pity stuck in the margin somewhere, just so whenever I'm trying to, to be really correct on something, I want to know that, that this word is related to these other passages because the word behind our English term is the same. You would know that here. You'd see mercies, and then you'd think, oh, yeah, I just read, where was that? Chapter 9 and verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I have, will have mercy. And so we have mercy. And really, you should have read, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And those compassion terms are related to this mercy term because both of them are pity terms. They're neither mercy terms nor compassion terms, but they're pity terms. But see, we're not dealing with a, you know, a heresy or an error or anything like this. It's not that the word just gives a totally different meaning here, or it gives a stronger meaning than the earlier term, but not just a totally different meaning. 2 Corinthians 1.3. NIV stays with mercy there, but we'll find its inconsistencies. 2 Corinthians 1.3, where the NIV goes back to compassion. And by the way, did you notice there in Romans 12, 1, it was in the plural. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God. Almost always, it's only a plural term. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. The Father of pities. Or you could say pity, singular, if you mean in a collective sense. Then pity, singular, it really is pity in the plural. But you just are using it in a collective sense. So you don't have to have that funny reading, the, the father of all pities. You, then you think, pennies? What did you say? The father of all. The father of all pity. The, the, the God who has pity. The father of all pity. But you'd use pity singular, but it would be taken in a collective sense, which would mean it has a plural base to it. Philippians 2.1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels, <laughs> we'll be to that word later on. What in the world does that mean? If any bowels and mercies. NIV compassion. Paul pity. I didn't really mean it to come out that way or to sound that way, like these guys are really bad, but that's what Paul said. It's a pity word. It's not a mercy word. If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels, we'll change that word later on too. <laughs> We've got to change that word. Change that and leave mercies. That would be better than 
leaving that and changing mercies. But by the way, it's a related term. We've got to get our, our correct term in here for that word, but it's going to be related into this mercy, pity, sympathy, compassion group of terms. But um, he'll be one of the places we'll say, well, look, the two words are using the same verse. That must mean there's some difference between these terms then. They're using the same verse. That's one of the mercy, pity, sympathy, compassion terms. I'm just not telling you which one of those four it is. Well, not mercy. We've already covered mercy and not pity because we're finding pity here. It makes it either a sympathy or a compassion term for bowels. But anyway, we're not on bowels yet. We're on mercies, pity, or pities. It's a plural word, pities, but you could say pity in the singular and mean it in a collective sense. Then in Colossians 3.12, this is the only time in the New Testament, in the Greek New Testament, where it is found in a singular usage. And it's the time where the King James Version has it pluralized. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only time that it's supposed to appear in the singular. I mean, it's, it's almost always a plural term. And the one time it's finally singular, a singular term in the Greek, the KJV translators gave it to us in the plural. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now, we saw over in Philippians that it was bowels and mercies, as though it were two different things. And now it's bowels of mercies. At least, it know, at least it lets us know what type of bowels he has reference to here, the mercies kind. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Well, probably don't need to do much with that verse right yet. Cause we're going to doctor on it some more later on. Since they don't have the chi, they don't have the conjunction and separating bowels and mercies or bowels and pities it's it's the it should be bowels of mercy singular it's what the kjv should have given us if they're going to stay consistent with giving it to us as mercy instead of pity it should have been in the singular so you kind of have to know that it's either bowels of mercy or bowels of pity or we'll have to deal with the bowels term and then deal with the pity term in light of how we deal with the bowel term and that will be what we're going to do with that verse. So we have to kind of leave it right now. But that's another place where it's found. And then in Hebrews 10, 28. In Hebrews 10, 28. And here is the only place where the KJV has it in the singular. And it should be in the plural. Hebrews 10, 28. All right, you see all that confusion? It's a plural word, almost always, found only once in the singular in the Greek, and that's Colossians 3.12. And KJV gives it to us in the plural. And the only time they give it to us in the singular instead of Colossians 3.12 in the KJV is Hebrews 10.28. And here's one of its normal occurrences where it should be in the plural. Of course, it's okay, as I've already said, it's okay to leave it in the singular here as well as anywhere as long as we understand mercy collectively such as of the camp of Israel, since that must be what he's talking about here. If it was mercies plural, then it would be the mercy of each individual Israelite, which then we could just translate as mercy collectively to speak of the whole nation. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. It should have been died without mercies, it's plural, probably speaking of the mercy of each individual Israelite in the camp. You know, no one could, could pity this man if he had profaned the law of God, even if it was a relative, then he was to die the death instituted in Mosaic law, and no one was to pity him. But if you want to leave it singular, it's okay. But it's not okay to leave it mercy because it's not a mercy term, it's a pity term. He that despised Moses' law died without pities, it should be, under two or three witnesses. Died without the pities, plural, of each individual person in Israel. And then a final <coughs> term is oitermon. This is our third word. O-I-K-T-I-R-M-O-N. Oitermon. 
an adjective found three times. So we have a verb twice, a noun five times, an adjective three times for a total of ten times the pity words are found in the New Testament. Ten times for the pity words in the New Testament. And that then is, if you just want some of the statistics here, that then is contrasted with the 62 times that the mercy terms are found. Or 63 if you give us the Jude 23 time, which you'll have in other versions but not in the KJV. So we could say 63 times the mercy terms are found, only 10 times for the pity terms. So an adjective found three times, twice in Luke 6.36. Same as Matthew 5, you see, but Matthew gave us the mercy terms over there. Blessed are the merciful. We're talking about an adjective, merciful. That would mean pitiful then. He gave us the mercy terms in Matthew 5.7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Luke 6.36, be therefore pitiful, even as your father also is pitiful. Luke gives us the pitiful terms and not the merciful terms. Now, you see, here's, here's what they'll say then. Well, since, since obviously he's talking about the same thing, the words must be synonymous then. Well, uh, that could be argued on this basis. Uh, but that won't work if you find words together, or it won't work if you find out that one word has slightly different meaning than the other word, a little more pronounced than the other word. So Luke didn't give us the merciful terms, but the pitiful terms. Be therefore pitiful, as your father also is pitiful. So there it's found twice, the adjective, oitirmon. And then it's found in James 5.11, but the only other time where it appears. James 5.11, where it is translated, uh, let's see. James 5.11, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job, have seen the end of the Lord. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And of tender mercy. The word behind that is oitirmo. It should read and pitiful. And pitiful. Now, you could leave it as tender mercy because that's probably a good description of what pitiful means. Which then would bring us, this verse is a good springboard, this would then bring us to uh, kind of a discussion now of these two terms, mercy and pity. What's the connection between these two terms? There must be a relationship between them, but there must be a difference because they come from a different root. Well, let me give you a definition for mercy, first of all. And by the way, I have not forgotten what I promised, that I would, I would give you an appendix to your Christian ethics outline, at least the first one, because we haven't given one before, of a list of the virtues with the definitions that we've given you so that you'll have that available. But... I'm, I'm completed up to where we are right now, but I hate to give it to you with the total completion or then you'll know all the virtues in the future. So I'll either have to wait till I can fill a whole page up and I don't think I've got that much because the definitions and the words that we've covered thus far are not that, not that long or extensive, or I'll have to wait until we are through with the virtues. So we don't have that many more to go. We have some long ones to look at that are going to take a lot of time. So... I've got it as ready as I can have it. I'll eventually have that to you. I enjoy doing that, enjoy doing that, and you'll probably enjoy having it so you can just sit there and read all of those virtues and all of these definitions. Now, I said that mercy was to help the helpless. That was just a little, you know, brief definition. It meant to render assistance to the needy. But here's a definition, my definition of mercy. The emotion roused by contact with an affliction which comes undeservedly on someone else. The emotion roused by contact with an affliction which comes undeservedly 
on someone else. It is the feeling that arises from the side of injustice or misery done to another. Okay, do you need both of those again? The emotion, mercy. We're talking about mercy right now. We're looking at mercy and pity together here. Mercy is, is the emotion roused by contact with affliction which comes undeservedly on someone else. I'll give you the other here in a moment. In other words, um, again, we're being technical because we're taking all this time to study these words, but uh, you can hardly be real merciful toward me, you see, unless you see I'm suffering some type of affliction that I don't deserve. You'd have to fit another term in there. Maybe you're kind or good or tender-hearted or something. But you can hardly be merciful until there is an object undergoing affliction that they do not deserve. There's some injustice being uh, meted out there. Then that is when mercy comes into play. It's the feeling, moreover, that arises from the sign of injustice or misery done to another. <clears throat> the feeling that arises from the sign of injustice or misery done to or suffered by another. In other words, as, as you, if this has ever happened to you, if it hasn't, then... <laughs> Well, you're not merciful. <laughs> it's, it's what you feel whenever you drive down the road in um, an underdeveloped area, and I mean underdeveloped socially, economically, and every other way. And you look at all the little children out there, or maybe the strapping teenagers, you know, in a slum area is what I'm talking about, and your heart goes out to those people. All of this affliction that they are suffering we said undeservedly. Well, why did they deserve to have been born into a condition like that any more than you, and you were not born in a condition like that? See, they don't deserve it any more than you do. It's, it's undeserved in the sense, why does someone have to go through something like that? Why does someone have to experience something like that? Maybe, maybe it's, it's an old person this time, not a young one, but an old one, who back in the, the vigor of life was so full of themselves now they're growing senile. Now they can hardly feed themselves. And you just look at them. And what, what happens in you? Mercy. Merciful faults happen. It, it's, it's the feeling, the emotion that is roused in the person whenever you observe these things taking place to other people that they don't deserve. An old person does. I mean, we could say that we all deserve much, much more than we've ever suffered. We could say that. We're talking from the human point of view because that's how mercy is used in these Christian to Christian or Christian to non-Christian passages here. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. It's used in a sense like that. When you're looking out and see people who, who don't deserve, you would think, you know, I should be there. Or what preserved me from that? Not because, it's not because I didn't deserve these good things that I have. I mean, it's not because I did deserve these good things that I have, because I certainly didn't. And yet you got them anyway. And yet someone else goes without them. What's the difference then between mercy and pity? Pity, pity has the same meaning. Etymologically, it comes from the term mercy. <clears throat> mercy came first. It has the same meaning as mercy, but it has an added exclamation that I can only um, only render it something like this. For those on the tape, that is O H exclamation point. <laughs> mercy is just what what I gave you. This let's just say emotion. And then you have the whole sentence. It's this emotion or this feeling. Pity is oh with this emotion and this feeling. In other words, it's a stronger term. 
Now, you said mercy was the heavy weight, was the best one. Pity is stronger than mercy because it has the exact same meaning as mercy, plus you add in, oh, you know, an exclamation, a deep heart feeling there that goes deeper than mercy. That's interesting. Now, it just so happens, though, that pity is a relatively rare term. Whenever, in other words, it says that God is merciful toward us, that doesn't mean that, well, he doesn't love us enough to be pitiful to have those really strong feelings towards us. It's, it's just mercy. You know, it's just that mercy happens to be a, a more frequently used term. Essentially, they have the same meanings. But if we're going to make a distinction, again, I said so many of these terms are synonyms, but if we're going to make a distinction, uh, we're going to make a slight distinction that would make pity the stronger of the two terms. But you know what? It also says that God pities us. So it does use a stronger term in God's relationship to us. But not most of the time, just because it's not as popular a term. Even though it's a stronger term, it's just not as popular a term as is the term mercy. Now, mercy, mercy always follows grace in the apostolic salutation. Have you noticed that grace, mercy, the apostle would say whenever he begins his letters. Grace comes first. Mercy is always second. If it appears, it's always behind grace. Why is that? See, there's a theological meaning to that apostolic salutation. It's because mercy is for the needy. For the continuation of the... See, there's a theological meaning to that apostolic salutation. It's because mercy is for the needy. There's always the subject of need behind the term mercy or behind the term pity. The, me the definition, in other words, that I just gave you for mercy is the same definition for pity plus add an exclamation point. The emotion that you feel, the feeling that you have, it's the same definition. The words are almost exactly the same. So we could say pity in here as well, but it doesn't appear in the apostolic salutations because mercy is the more recurring word. Grace, mercy. Why does mercy follow and not come before grace? Because mercy is for the needy and grace is for the rebellious. And before God sees us as having a need, he sees us as a rebel. And our rebelliousness has to be dealt with, and that's with grace. Grace. Mercy deals with the fact that once we have been converted from being a rebel, now we need God. So which of the two terms, grace or mercy, is the stronger of the two? Grace, definitely. We don't sing, oh, amazing mercy. We sing amazing grace. Because it's more amazing that God would help a rebel than that he would help someone who had a need. I mean, a rebel does have a need. I don't mean that. But there's no idea of rebellion. There's no connotation of rebellion behind the term needy, a person who is a needy individual. So, I mean, it's God's great mercy that he's had upon us, but it's because we are needy that he has mercy upon us. Now, you see, you know how many times you just use the term mercy, but unless you really, you have to remember this term needy. It's always needy. It's always affliction. There's always some suffering going on. It doesn't have to be some, uh, you know, real big suffering like a physical suffering or something. It's basically spiritual that God sees in us. That we are needy people and therefore God has mercy on us. In other words, he doesn't have mercy. He doesn't have grace on us because we're needy. He just sent us to hell. That's what we need is hell. We're rebellious. So he has grace first. Grace to the rebellious. Mercy to the needy. Grace, mercy, and peace, aren't those generally found together? Grace, mercy, and peace? Peace, because peace is the result of grace and mercy. So that's why those three so many times come together in the apostolic salutations. Grace, because we're rebellious. Mercy, because we are needy. And peace is the product of God's grace and his mercy. See, there's a meaning to that little salutation. He didn't write like we sometimes do sincerely at the end of a letter. We don't mean sincerely. <laughs> when we write uh, humbly yours, and we're the most arrogant person around. 
But that's just a popular thing to end a letter with, humbly yours or something. Sincere thanks. We don't sincerely thank them at all. It's convenient. It's status quo to write that. Well, see, Paul didn't write from the basis of what's convenient. Grace, mercy, and peace. For him, it had some meaning. First, it's God's love to the rebellious sinner. Then it's God's love to those who need him. And then we get peace as a result from that. So the second group of words, the pity words mean mercy plus, which you can just write mercy plus is what they mean, mercy plus. So let's kind of go over these two groups of words together here. Um, Jude, let's see what we have. Let's see what we have as far as Christians are concerned. We have Jude 22 and 23. As far as Christians are concerned, so we're going to be pulling these references together, not right now so much of God's mercy and God's pity toward us, but what we are expected to manifest as a virtue. We have Jude 22 and 23, if some have mercy, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh and we also have should have another mercy term there in 23 then we have Matthew 9 13 and again remember I think it was in the last message we were saying while you're turning to Matthew 9 13 uh, Jesus and the Apostles never have any reference to humanitarian concerns as being the ultimate thing that pleases God these are heavenly virtues the fruit of the Spirit. They're heavenly virtues that are to be manifested in our lives. But if you've never been to this state, you've never been in a place where you can experience, and it, it shouldn't, it, it doesn't take a drive to uh, the Bronx or something to experience this, just to see the way some people live and the way some people are, and not to have this emotion rising up in your heart. I mean, so many times what would would come up in most people's hearts is just you would despise the person you know when you see a mother at the store and you see this little troop of malnourished and i mean it with food with love with education with assistance with help they're malnourished in all regard a little troop of these guys falling behind her you just think these children's lives are being ruined what are they going to amount to as an adult with that thing as their parent that thing, that mother, that father, that thing as their parent, what are these children going to amount to? And your heart can't go out to them. I'm talking about them. Of course, then it should go out to the parent as well. They're not just a thing. Maybe they used to be a part of a little troop like that in their early life. And look how they turned out. And like begets like. And their children are going to end up like they ended up because they were a child like that at one time. You can either think that way or you can just despise the person. And, and you despise them from what? From your, from your pedestal, your privileged position that you have. You're more educated. You're more refined. You're more la de do well-to-do. You've been brought up better. You can despise them because you don't like being around filth like that. Uh, if it's a white person, what we always call them was white trash, you know. You ever heard of that term before, white trash? She's nothing but white trash. He's nothing but white trash. There aren't any people who are trash, dear friends. God made every individual. The devil has entered into this world and, and wreaked havoc and caused misery in the lives of people. That's why, that's what mercy and pity are all about. There's no such thing as, as trash as a person. Now, they may have almost degenerated in their morals to the place of being a trashy person. But you know what I mean by white trash? Just... You can drive by their house. Oh, there are 14 junk cars out there. None of them run. There are 14 horses, 14 cows, 14 pigs. Oh, look at the cats and the dogs around there. That house hadn't been painted in years. There's probably no heat. Plastic wraps the whole house to hold some a little bit of heat in there. There are no steps to the front porch or just a swing or a go-go stick you jump on and bounce up to the porch. The mailbox kind of hangs, the door just hangs open, and it rains on the mail all the time. You know, and there are lots of old tires and old batteries laying around everywhere. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You've seen some white trash before, huh? 
Oh, they're just everywhere. They're here in Vermont. A lot of them are here in Vermont. Just miserable looking places with bugs in the house and bugs in the hair and bugs everywhere. And people really live like that. And you can either drive by and just think, oh, you ought to send those people to another place. The value of my property goes down. It's the first thing a homeowner thinks is the value of my property goes down. We can't have any white trash moving in next door to us. Or down south, no black people. Why? The property value goes down. Next time the assessor comes along, your house not worth too much anymore. What happened to your house? Nothing. Your neighbors moved in, though. That's what happened to your house. That's what happened to your property there. It's more difficult to sell now. Unless you want to sell it to white trash. <laughs> and you don't want to do that. Well, it can be either that thought or a thought of a pity. Pity. Now, pity, I guess, in the English terminology now, is it, just a word that means nothing, but you kind of feel sorry for the individual. You pity them. It's a stronger biblical term than that. It's a mercy term with an exclamation point. It's a mercy term with a plus sign after it. It's not just, well, I feel sorry, because it's always on the basis, our understanding of these, remember, on the basis, is on the basis of the, of the manifestation of these in Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just that he felt sorry for us. Oh, well, he felt sorry for us, but he did something about it. He lowered himself to help us. Now, now that we're on that plane, let's deal with that a little bit. Have you ever met any white trash as bad as you in the eyes of God? You're just white trash. Or if you're black, you're black trash. And Jesus Christ came and took up residence in our midst. That doesn't compare to you moving into that house next door to you that you think looks like white trash. He came and took upon himself, we're told, over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 4, sinful flesh. doesn't matter whether it's white or black or trashy, it's sinful. And he came to live among us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. We could say that, that God so loved the world that he did something about it. God was, was so merciful and so pitiful toward the world that he did something about it. God gave his unique son that if we would only believe in him, we would have everlasting life and never perish. So Jesus Christ is our supreme example to imitate in walking in mercy and in understanding pity. Well, I was in Matthew 9, 13. Well, let's read verses uh, 10 through that <clears throat> because I guess that's kind of appropriate that I got off on that because this was the attitude of the Pharisee. They didn't want to be around Jewish trash. They didn't recognize that in God's eyes they are as much if not more Jewish trash than these sinners, so-called publicans and sinners that we always read about in the Gospels, and these so-called publicans and sinners, what were the Pharisees? But sinners, though. But they meant notorious sinners. Well, what were the Pharisees? But notorious sinners. But they sinned, you know, with, with, uh, in, in religious areas. They weren't like these women in the Gospels, you know, these sinning women that come to Jesus and get converted, and all oh, the Pharisees just... Uh, just about have a cow over that that Jesus would would let some woman who was a sinner and we think we think that we know what type of sinner he meant for a woman you know she wasn't one who robbed banks or your local tax collector's booth or something we know what type of sinner it is if it was a woman it comes and touches Jesus I don't want that thing to touch me that slummy sleazy individual that white trash that Jewish trash came and anointed Jesus wept over him dried up tears with her hair. The Pharisees didn't like that at all. Mingling with the wrong group of people. No mercy, no pity. And what did he say over there in Matthew 23? Oh, you've been, you've been acute in keeping these technicalities, but you have omitted the, what, weightier matters of the law. Judgment and mercy and faith. What's weightier, tithing or mercy? He said mercy is a weightier matter of the law. He said these ought you to have done, but not to have left the others undone. 
You can't do one in the place of the other. He said you should have done it all, but your emphasis should have been on judgment, mercy, and faith, not tithing seeds, not tithing anything, not in any offerings or sacrifices. That was going to be done away with anyway, and it is here at the end of his ministry in life. These other things have never been done away with and never shall be. Well, came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, that's from the point of view of the Pharisees because if, if Matthew wanted to make his comment, he'd say many publicans and sinners. And then in the next verse, he'd say, and when the sinners saw it, in verse 11, because that's what they were too, when the sinners saw the other sinners. So it's from the point of view of the Pharisees. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why eateth thy teacher, your master, this religious figure with publicans and sinners, which can only mean the Pharisees didn't. When Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. See, this is no proof text for medical science here. <laughs> Some ignorant person thought that up. Verse 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy. And he's quoting probably many passages from the Old Testament, but Hosea and Mike are probably the two best guesses for what he's quoting here, particularly in Hosea chapter 6, I believe. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Of course, he does not mean there that the Pharisees were righteous, and therefore he came only to the sinners and publicans because he came to call the sinners to repentance. He's, he's making a distinction between that which is obvious and that which is not. And basically, he didn't really come for the Pharisees because they never would allow him to shed mercy on them. So what does this interesting phrase mean? I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Well, it's rather obvious, but it's, it's obscure at the same time. And I think I, in the last message, toward the end of it, quickly, hurriedly, briefly explain this. God's not saying that he wants us to show mercy on him, on God. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Because we do offer sacrifices to him, you see. So the comparison breaks down if you try to keep it the same. God says, we'd end up with, I don't want you to offer sacrifices to me, but offer mercy to me. No, it's really not that. He's really saying, I don't want you to offer sacrifice to me, but I want you to offer mercy to others, to live a merc merciful life. And what will that show? That will speak much better of ten thousands of rivers of oils. Of the person, it will speak more highly of the person to be a merciful person than to be one who offers sacrifice. And we've given you earlier the other times where this appears in the New Testament, the same phrase here like in chapter 12 and verse 7, same phrase. If he had known what this meaneth, this is in the question of um, uh, the Sabbath day here, eating on the Sabbath day. If he had known what this meaneth, and we dealt in a lot of detail with this passage earlier in ethics, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He would not have condemned the guiltless. Of course, he, he's saying that the disciples were not guilty in doing what the Pharisees thought was work on the Sabbath day. Then I've already given you chapter 23 and verse 23. But this, of course, still speaks of the Christian's relationship to others, not God's mercy or God's pity to us, but the Christian's relationship. Well, what are you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? You pay tithe of all of these herbs and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These all ye too have done, and not to leave the other undone. And then James 2.13. James 2.13. Which I also explained hurriedly earlier. For he shall have judgment without mercy that had showed no mercy so here's kind of uh, a warning well it's a definite warning he said so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty you practice liberty toward others you practice love you practice mercy toward others and it will be practiced unto you 
but he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Uh, I guess that's a fairly good translation. <clears throat> uh, what does it say in the margin? Mercy glorieth against judgment. But it means that, um, um, that uh, mercy, mercy is going to be victorious over judgment. That's what he means. Something like mercy will uh, triumph. Maybe that's the term I'm looking for. Mercy will triumph over judgment. That is, if we practice what he said here in verse 12. And if we don't, we get the first part of verse 13 then. He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy triumphs against judgment. God, in other words, will not judge us in the uh, condemning sense, but rather he'll have mercy on us. Then Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Well, that's the same thing as what James is teaching here. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And they won't be judged without mercy. Romans 12, 8. Him, let him that showeth mercy doeth, do it with cheerfulness. So those are the mercy passages. Then Philippians 2, 1. <clears throat> All of these are the Christian passages of these virtues. Philippians 2, 1 to get the pity text in now. So we tie mercy in with pity. We only have a couple of these really that, that speak of um, pity. Really only three, I believe, that speak of pity that we should have toward one another. Others of these, like what, Romans 9:15, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, I'll have pity on whom I'll have pity. Well, that's God's pity on us. <clears throat> so that's not a pity passage for Christian virtues there. It's just a pity passage. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, or comfort of love, or fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and pity, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded having the same love of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through strife or vain glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others and let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus so he's talking about christian virtues there the way christians in the church here among the philippians how they are to relate to one another so the pity then of philippians 2 1 would be a personal christian pity passage then Colossians 3.12, of course, is the parallel. Is a parallel. Colossians 3.12. Put on, therefore, as God's elect, holy and beloved, bowels of pity. Leaving it that way for right now. We'll work on this later on, but bowels of pity, because the mercy's word is the pity word, but it's the only time where it should be singular, not plural. Bowels of pity. He says, put these things on. There's a Christian virtue then. He goes on to mention kindness. We've talked about that. Humility. That's what humbleness of mind is. We've talked about that. Meekness. We've discussed that. Long-suffering. We have it. Forbearing. We have it. <coughs> Forgiving. We have it. And we'll be to those later, of course. And then Luke 6.36. Luke 6.36 would then be the only other pity passage. We're, of course, similar to Matthew 5, 7, we're told to be pitiful as our Father in heaven is pitiful. Now, some of these pity passages, most of these pity passages, are God's pity toward us. Romans 9, 15, I will have mercy, exclamation point, which is pity. I will have pity on whom I will have pity. A feeling that arises from the sight of injustice or maybe misery. Uh, the Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, by God's pity. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. The God of all pity. And then the Hebrews 10, 28. That doesn't really relate to our pity or to God's pity. But then we do have James 5 and verse 11. James 5.11, for God's pity on us. Mm -hmm. 
last part of that verse, he says, we know that the Lord is of tender mercy or pitiful. Now, now you can see why I said earlier, if you recall, if you don't, I'm going to tell it to you again, why if you left it of tender mercy, that would kind of be okay because it's something in addition to mercy. It's tender mercy. And I said maybe tender mercy is a good way to explain what pity is, tender mercy. But of course the problem is you're stuck with the mercy term there when really it's a pity term. So pitiful there would be essentially the same as uh, a tender mercy. Okay, one more thing we need to do. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think we've got enough time to go beyond just the mercy and the pity terms. Uh, but let's look at a couple of places where uh, we could have better translations uh, than what we have. I'm almost out of, I'm out of room up here on the board. We have two other terms I want to give you that in the KJV have come out as pity terms uh, that uh, really are not pity terms. First of these is jusplaknos. E-U-S-P-L-A-G-C-H-N-O-S. Eusplaknos. I hate not to write it for you. I hate to take the time to get all of this erased. Which looks like that. Some of you are wanting to get all of this down the right way. Which looks like that. Use. Use plonk nos. E U S P L A G C H N O S. If you're wondering about the pronunciation, whenever you get a gamma next to a chi or chai, uh, it produces a funny sound. Okay, in First uh, Peter chapter three and verse eight, let's see what we have here. According to my Bible, we have many things that need to be changed, some of which already have, I believe. Finally. Here's one of those little short verses, but it's a verse packed with virtues. 1 Peter 3, 8. And the term we're going to find here is a eusplachnos term. And not one of the oik terms. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. So there's compassion anyway, at least in the KJV. Love, there's love, as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Now, I think we've changed courteous to humble. It's not a courteous term. It's not a hospitality term. It's a humility term. It should be humble. Courteous should be humble. Well, here we have another Christian virtue verse for Christian pity. But it's not a pity term. It's not an oik term for pitiful here. It's this term <coughs> I've listed up for you, jusplanknos, which you might recognize as being one of the tender-hearted terms or the tender-hearted term that I gave you before. <coughs> now, it's going to be very, very similar to the compassion term. You'll see that whenever I give you compassion. If you just go back in your notes and look for the way that the tender-hearted term, we only gave you one term because there's only one term that's found, is spelled, either in English or in Greek, <coughs> then you'll see that it's going to be very similar to the compassion term, but it is a little bit different. This is a unique word. It's only found here in the New Testament. It's a compound word, and uh, it means tender-hearted. Just like, just like the tender-hearted term that we looked at earlier, which I don't remember offhand, but it's, it's the same splunknos term, just like you'll find with um, a splunknon, which is a compassion term. So that should be tender-hearted. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, tender-hearted. Be tender-hearted, be humble. And then if you go over to James, back to James. That's one I've been looking for. Uh, oh, it's that verse we were in, James 5.11.
James chapter 5 and verse 11. We take this term starting with the S and add that to it. That's our second term. P O L U S P L A G C H N O S. <coughs> That's the term found here in James 5:11. Paulus Plaknos. Paulus Plaknos. You can tell, obviously, since I told you, just go up here and start with your sigma here, that it's a, same, it's a very similar term here. It's a compound term. It's got a different prefix to it. And there doesn't seem to be any way to differentiate between these prefixes here. So, basically, it means tender-hearted. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very... See, I just told you that last phrase of tender mercy really means pitiful. But then we'd have the Lord is very pitiful and pitiful in the KJV. You see that. So it should read that the Lord is very tender hearted. And then pitiful is the second term, very tender hearted and pitiful. That means God is full of pity. So we certainly see that God has pity that he manifests toward us. Romans 9.15, Romans 12.1, and then here we find it in James 5.11. The Lord is very tender-hearted, and the Lord is full of mercy with a plus. Mercy with an exclamation point, which equals pity in the New Testament. God is full of pity. His emotions, his feelings are roused over our misery and affliction that we suffer, over anyone's misery or affliction that they suffer. Hence, we have God's mercy God's merciful or God's pity, God is pitiful. Now, pitiful to us, remember, means, you know, bad. It's a bad term, wretched. We speak of that being a pitiful individual over there. That's not the way we're using it. We're using it just as a compound term. Pitiful means full of pity. God is full of pity and we are to be full of pity. 